Welcome back to the second part of this morning's uh, session uh, at our uh, event, Understanding Food in a Digital World. We are now at session three. We are still looking at uh, different uh, methods for innovative data collection in a changing food landscape. And the first presenters are um, Dom Frabus and Georgia Zamariola from Risk Communication Team at the European Food Safety Authority. And they will be presenting about participatory approaches in developing new risk assessment and communication tools. So over to uh, Dom and Georgia. As before, please keep putting your question in the Q&A box and at the end of this uh, presentation, there will be 10 minutes uh, to go through your questions. Please, as I said earlier, can you write your name and affiliation if it doesn't appear automatically in uh, your question? Thank you. Ready. Okay, hello, uh, good afternoon or good morning. Um, my name is Doma Goyverbos uh, and I'm um, a social scientist and team leader in strategic communication team in the uh, European Food Safety Authority, EFSA in Parma. And I have my colleague Georgia with me. Georgia, please. Hello everyone, my name is Georgia. And uh, I work uh, in EFSA as well. Uh, my background is in psychology uh, and I work uh, in a Domagos team. Okay. Thank you. Back to you, Domagoy. Thanks. So what we will do now is I will show you, uh, let me share my screen. OK, so today we're going to talk about participatory approaches to uh, developing new risk assessment and communication tools. Actually, what we wanted to talk to you is about a bit how we engaging about, about some of our projects that talk about engaging grassroots stakeholders through focus groups and then also talking a bit about using focus groups in the old world where they were predominantly used. Uh, let's say physically moving towards more online discussion groups and to do this we will represent we will. So we will split this presentation in two parts sort of the first part is talking about a recent project that we've done that is still being finalized um, and in which we looked at the interesting approach to sampling an interesting group of stakeholders and then we're going to talk about um, how, what we are thinking of in future in terms of online discussions so uh, the, the project I, the, the the area which I want to talk about a bit is B health so B health is quite a interesting area in, in, and is part of EFSA's remit and it's quite a discussed topic here we have an, an example from the social media monitoring example just to let you know that B health is a quite a discussed topic um, with mixed sentiments because it, it has a lot of issues around B health environmental sustainability um, also the use of uh, plant protection products, but also linkages to agriculture and uh, the sustainable goals. So it's a quite discussed topic and EFSA works a lot on bee health from a different point of view. Uh, and there is a lot of work in terms of risk assessment and communication when it comes to bee health. So recently, um, so recently EFSA received uh, um, one of its mandates on bee health that is linked to uh, providing a holistic risk assessment approach to the health of um, honeybees. And uh, as part of the risk assessment approach, the, the group of scientists that worked with the risk on this risk assessment has approached us in social science and we've decided to work on a joint sort of a research where we would like to also enhance dialogue with beekeepers and talk a bit about see the views on beekeepers when it comes to this process. So the interesting thing about this project for us was that we were um, we were faced with the situation in which, you know, EFSA is a European uh, Food Safety Authority. We work in we cover all the member states and we were faced with a situation where we said, OK, we want to do focus groups with beekeepers. How do we do this? How do we sample beekeepers across Europe? What criteria do we use? It's not really your average uh, focus group where you, you, you draw from consumer panels and it's also not our average, you know, discussing just with organizations at EU level, but we wanted to think a bit on how we would be able to sample and conduct focus groups at the grassroots level 
with uh, maybe a community of stakeholders that is not so usual when we do sampling and social research. So I'll let Georgia talk a bit about how we sampled and what we asked them in the focus groups. Over to you, Georgia. Thank you, Domagoy. Uh, yes, as Domagoy was saying, uh, indeed there uh, was uh, um, a first for us because we're used uh, uh, mainly uh, to network uh, at the European level, uh, but this time uh, we wanted really uh, to focus uh, more on the national and also regional level. Um, this is why uh, we, of course, uh, contacted uh, um, uh, national uh, associations uh, uh, of beekeeping and beekeepers, uh, and uh, we gathered contacts from them. Um, so it was really a long work of collecting uh, all contacts, all associations, uh, and we selected these eight countries that you can see uh, in the image here. Uh, this was related uh, to different criteria, uh, like the number of the hives, uh, and also, of course, we consulted uh, with the science unit in EFSA uh, to um, understand uh, uh, the different landscape that we can find uh, in these countries. Uh, so as you can see, there are countries uh, that have more a southern landscape. Uh, therefore, uh, there, of course, beekeeping is different uh, than what is happening in a central or a northern landscape. Uh, we learned a lot on bee health, I must admit. Um, at the beginning, we didn't know these differences, but we wanted, of course, uh, to have a representation uh, of these different landscapes. Um, as you can see, we selected uh, Spain, France, Greece and Bulgaria for the southern. Uh, central, we have Belgium, Germany and Slovenia. And for the northern landscape, uh, we chose Denmark. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Uh, this uh, is uh, to show you uh, the methodology that uh, we chose. Um, as we mentioned, uh, this uh, uh, was done uh, through focus groups because uh, we wanted really um, uh, an in-depth research. Uh, we didn't want to rely only on surveys uh, because we know uh, that, of course, the community of beekeepers uh, is more difficult to reach and uh, we wanted to have a balance uh, between uh, also professional and hobbyist beekeepers. Um, and this is why uh, this was uh, the methodology chosen. Um, we managed to have uh, uh, six to 12 beekeepers uh, and we held uh, uh, one focus group per country. Uh, this was done uh, before COVID, likely. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it was uh, really a lucky, lucky moment because, uh, uh, of course, now uh, it's, uh, it would be more difficult to have face-to-face uh, -face interactions. Um, um, in these discussions, of course, uh, there were different topics. Uh, as you can see, we call them packages, uh, but yeah, it's mainly topics of discussions. Uh, the first one uh, was more uh, on the regulation in place uh, that protects bee health, uh, what beekeepers think about it. Uh, then uh, there was a discussion around uh, the data uh, that beekeepers would like to receive, uh, for example, uh, regarding yeah, the health of their bees. Um, uh, digital tools, uh, of course, uh, um, beekeepers, uh, some of them use already digital tools. Uh, uh, to manage their hives, uh, but others, uh, uh, for example, uh, have a more traditional approach. Um, this is why we wanted really to understand uh, what is their attitude uh, towards digital tools. And in the last one, uh, we had more um, their opinions uh, on the research that can be helpful for be health. Um, of course, yeah, it was uh, um, really, as I said, uh, the first time for us uh, um, really dealing uh, with more national and regional level. Uh, and uh, then uh, uh, the beekeepers had uh, the opportunity to see uh, the report uh, that uh, we provided. Um, and they had the chance uh, to also comment further uh, on what they said during uh, these discussions. So, 
Um, so I think it was really a good opportunity because they appreciated uh, the fact of being involved uh, in this project uh, and uh, yeah, indeed in a more in-depth uh, discussion. Yeah. Over to you, Don Magoy. Thank you, Georgia. Yeah, it's, it, it was, as Georgia said, quite an interesting project, which for us, um, apart from the fact that we got valuable insights, but it was really a first for us in terms of engaging this, as I said, grassroots levels of stakeholders, and we plan to do more of this. And it was quite, um, it was quite uh, informing for us also to, to do, to think about the mix of social research methods that we employ. Um, Obviously, by the way, this work, uh, the, the, the reports will be finalized and uh, when EFSA scientific uh, report will be up for public consultation, you will be able to find also the results from the social research part. We, we can keep you updated when this will be online. Uh, so it's still in draft. Uh, but what, we, what, what, what was really interesting for us is that when this project ended, we said, great. So focus groups really work great for, for uh, getting this qualitative insights, but also for kind of um, this engagement gains because we saw that people were very engaged and they felt quite uh, appreciative of the fact that we had uh, organized this um, organized this session. So the question now is now we have COVID and um, now we have another project coming up, which is more on citizen side, but uh, we would also like to conduct focus groups and obviously we will not be able to do this face to face. So we will be transitioning to online discussion groups. Uh, in the transition to online discussion groups, um, we will be thinking more about how to try to um, engage and how to make a balanced representation of views, but at the same time, looking at the let's say limitations of online discussion groups, try to see that we can we can source consumers and uh, source of uh, screen consumers that can give us in a shorter period of time um, more in-depth. Um, findings on what we will be looking for, but also thinking of how to be able to, and will we be ever be able, if we continue doing online discussion groups, have sort of the same engagement gains that we would maybe get from an online, from a face-to-face -face focus group. These are things that we need to still consider, but we will be using the results and lessons we had from the Beekeeper project to continue using uh, qualitative methods online and see what are the pros and cons of this transition. And with that, uh, I thank you and we close the presentation. We can't hear you, Vanna. Vanna, you're on mute. Oh, sorry. Uh, thanks, Don. Thanks, Georgia. Um, so we are now moving to the second presentation in this session. Uh, we have Helen Hart and Katharina Porton from uh, the social science team here at FSA, who will be talking um, about the findings from a qualitative and washing research uh, innovative uh, app uh, ethnographic app that has been developed internally. Um, Helen, Katarina, over to you. Hi everybody, um, good, nearly good afternoon. Um, as Vanna said, I'm Helen Hurd and I'll be presenting today with Catherine. Um, I work in the social science team at the Food Standards Agency. Um, Catherine, do you want to introduce yourself as well? Yes, thanks, Helen. Hi, everyone. I'm Catherine Porter. I work in the same team as Helen at the FSA, uh, and I'll be co-presenting this next section with Helen. OK, I'll just share my slides. OK, so today we're going to be presenting on a recent piece of qualitative research into hand washing, um, which used an innovative app methodology. So firstly, what is this project all about? Um, the FSA have an interest in hand washing because it's known to be a defence against foodborne disease. As a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, we anticipate that hand washing is at an all time high and we're currently monitoring the um, the amount of hand washing going on in amongst consumers using our quarterly tracking survey. A key knowledge gap in quantitative trackers is understanding the how and why people wash their hands in the way they do. So this piece of qualitative research helps us to explore hand washing in more detail. Uh, it adds to our body of evidence and therefore it helps us to plan interventions 
and make new policies that help to prevent foodborne disease. So here on this slide, you can see our project aims. I won't go through them all, but please feel free to have a read through. And we designed this project in two phases. Firstly, we developed a two week ethnographic app study, and this is going to be the main focus of today's presentation. We have initial findings from this phase and Catherine will provide more detail in a moment about the methodology that was used. We've also carried out phase two and that is still ongoing and in progress. Um, but that was uh, regarding in-depth interviews. And again, these play an important role into understanding um, people's hand washing behaviours. As the project is still ongoing, we can only share initial findings today, but please keep an eye on the FSA website next year because we do intend to publish our findings when the project is complete. I'll hand over to Catherine now to talk through the methodologies that we used. Thanks, Helen. Um, so why use an ethnographic app to answer our research questions? Um, well, there are a few reasons why we felt that this approach would be appropriate, and we've drawn out some of these on the slide that you can see here. Um, the first is that we are very much aware of the potential for social desirability bias to influence the results we would likely obtain um, due to the nature of the subject we were exploring, and we wanted a way to minimise this effect. Um, so this mode of data collection removes the physical presence of the researcher to some extent, so it therefore distances the researcher, which can, which can help lessen the fear of receiving um, a negative reaction to behaviours that participants may think are undesirable. Collecting data in this way also allowed the focus of questions to be narrowed over a longer time period to more specific behaviours um, that, participants may, be find, uh, that may, participants may find embarrassing. We were also aware that recall bias can affect handwashing reporting. Um, an app approach can use interruptive questioning to ask participants to report on very recent behaviours, therefore helping to minimise this. And finally, this approach enabled us to place behaviours into a wider context. So we used the app itself to capture handwashing behaviours, and then these were used in a follow up interview to really dig into the reasons or motivations behind participants' actions in different scenarios and to fully appreciate the detail of what can often be seen as quite a mundane activity. Um, so next slide please, Helen. Helen, if we could just have the next slide. Um, I'm not sure maybe I've, if I'm not seeing the next slide, if everyone else can see it, but I'll just proceed um, anyway. So in terms of how the app worked in practice, um, the app we used is called Ipsos App Life and it was operated and run by Ipsos Mori, who were our contractors for phase one of this project. Um, while Ipsos Mori operated the app, the FSA project team developed the materials in close collaboration with our contractor team so that we could ensure the app captured the data that we needed it to. Um, following a warm up interview in which participants were set up on the app, they were then issued with questions via the app over a two week fieldwork period. Um, 12 participants were recruited to take part. And they would typically receive one to two questions per day. While the questions had been scheduled in advance, responses were reviewed frequently by the moderators and additional follow up questions were asked as and when needed. Um, participants were also encouraged to upload photos and videos as part of their responses and on the slide you can see some examples of photos taken by participants of the sinks where they last washed their hands after we asked them to describe these for us. Um, so this two week um, period was then followed by a wrap up interview in which the behaviours documented over the two weeks were explored with the participants in more detail. On the next slide um, are some examples of the questions we scripted for the participants. Um, for example, you can see on day seven at 4 p.m. participants were asked to describe the last time they washed their hands with water uh, with some prompts around how they did this. Um, they were then encouraged to share a video describing what they did or they could write out the process if they preferred. Um, participants were then asked to rate on a scale from one to ten how thorough they thought that hand wash was um, and to tell us a bit about how they came to that conclusion. Um, so yeah, overall, that is a very brief overview of how the app worked in practice, and I'll just pass back to Helen now, who will cover the initial findings. Um, Helen, we can't hear you.
Sorry about that. I think I'm just having a few network problems. I'll try and carry on as normal. So just to give some brief overview of initial findings um, that came from the app based research, um, we found that participants understood that a good hand wash used warm water, soap and a clean towel. They understood that technique and time spent hand washing was important. And whilst participants used hand gel, they tended to be less favourable to soap and water. Participants often described a feeling of safety in their own home or with their own possessions. Um, that meant they felt they didn't need to wash their hands at home as much as when they were outside of their home. And hand washing was scenario dependent and was often linked to a sensory experience, such as a need to remove stickiness from the hands. We also found that um, barriers to hand washing come in different forms. So participants often mentioned a physical barrier, such as sore hands or stiff joints, and others mentioned uh, a lack of facilities when outside the home, which often led to feelings of anxiety or feeling unclean. And others mentioned having competing priorities or not having time to wash their hands thoroughly. The COVID pandemic has led to a huge awareness of hand washing and campaign materials uh, to encourage hand washing. Participants see hand washing as a social responsibility to protect themselves and others. Whilst this um, shows a change in their hand washing routines because of COVID. Um, so, for example, participants reported washing their hands for longer, more thoroughly and in more situations than they would have prior to the pandemic. It's important to note that these findings are really interesting, but there's a lot we haven't been able to cover today because we just simply not had time. Um, so please, as I say, keep an eye out for our publication in the future. And we may need to repeat research of this nature again in the future so that we can understand whether these new behaviours are maintained or if consumers relax their hand washing as the pandemic comes to an end. Um, so this was the first time we had used this method for data collection and so um, we wanted to wrap up really by um, sharing with you some reflections on how we felt this went for us. Um, the app allowed us to collect relatively detailed information on the participants hand washing behaviours um, and the structure of the approach with the two interviews either side um, allowed for both the wider context around participants lives to be captured at the start, uh, as well as detailed probing to be conducted at the end on the behaviours um, that were documented whilst the app was live. Um, a downside, however, was that as the app was managed by our contractors, once it was live, the FSA team um, could not really be involved in the immediate response to what participants were telling us. So deciding what follow ups to ask and, and, and what we wanted to explore in a bit more detail. Um, although we did uh, were able to um, feed into this process before the wrap up interview stage. Um, overall, though, we didn't really experience any technical issues with the app. Um, this was most likely because we, the app we were using was well established and well run by our contractors. Um, we also found that engagement was high and well maintained over the fieldwork period. Uh, this may reflect to some extent the incentive that was offered to participants. Um, a full detailed report on this part of the project will be published on the FSA website in 2021 alongside our findings from phase two, which is ongoing at the moment. Um, in the meantime, Helen and my emails are on the final slide. Uh, please do get in touch with us if you have any further questions or comments about the study, uh, which aren't covered in the panel discussion a bit later. Um, but thank you very much for listening to us. Excellent. Thank you very much, Helen and Katerina. Uh, we are now moving to the third and last presentation for this session. I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Christian Reynolds, a senior lecturer at the Center for Food Policy, City University, and visiting researcher at the Department of Geography at the University of Sheffield. Um, uh, Dr. Reynolds will be talking about citizen science can be applied to food. Thank you very much. Um, good to see you all here. I'll just start sharing my screen. 
Right. So today, uh, as was just introduced, I'll be talking about food and citizen science as part of uh, today's talk for the ESLC Festival of Social Sciences. Um, I myself, I'm, my name is Christian Reynolds. I'm a senior lecturer at the Centre for Food Policy. Prior to that, I was up in the University of Sheffield at the Institute for Sustainable Food um, and then many other places besides. I mainly work in the intersection between healthy, sustainable diets and uh, food consumption, including food waste. But I also look at cooking and many other things, including digital humanities and citizen science, which is what we'll be talking about today. So today I'll go a quick introduction to what citizen science, the methodology is, some ideas around a review that we've recently carried out into how food and food research could interact with citizen science methodologies, and then give you a bit more personal information about how I got into citizen science way back when, and some examples that you might be interested in today of how we view citizen science as a research methodology in the last couple of years. And those are specifically some online experiments, comparing those to survey data, um, looking at how gamification of citizen science might be used and then finally a little bit of a sneak preview of some work that um, is currently under review around a living lab experiment in citizen science at the University of Sheffield. So citizen science is research where public citizens participate and co-design the research as investigators in research projects alongside scientists. So this means that it engages a diversity of people, uh, but it's also enabled by scientists. So this means scientists take a slightly different approach to research to it all being top down. But also, it's not about just engaging wildly, uh, widely, um, but it's about bringing different perspectives and different understanding solutions um, to enable a, a wider uptake of different innovation. So uh, enabling a, a lot of a different research agenda. And this is a very whistle stop tour of this, but I would encourage people to read within the book Citizen Science, uh, which I just posted down there, um, Robinson's chapter on the 10 principles of citizen science, which is a really good way to start getting your hand around this. But for everybody playing at home, um, just think about this is how citizens can do more than just answer surveys. This is actually getting them engaged with research. But what do I actually mean by that? There's lots of different levels of what you could mean by doing more than surveys. So there's this brain escalator model of citizen science engagement. Um, from a EU citizen science project called Doing It Together. So at the bottom, we have everybody in the EU, 50 million uh, EU citizens, but only some of them passively consume science. What do I mean by passive? You go to the museum, you go to a library, but how do you actually start getting people actively consuming, engaging in science? And that's things like the Zooniverse project, where you get people to classify or use um, different um, ways to actually input data into a science project. But it then links up and goes further than that. So there's things such as World Community Grid or British Trust Ornithology, where they actually get people to spot birds out in the wild, or say the DIY biology blog run by this, which was where people actually did biology and science experiments within their own homes. So there's a sliding scale or escalator of people moving up the different levels of this. So you could consider, say, the beekeeper example of focus groups. If you then the EU Food Safety went out with those people to try new practices after the focus group and engage them in different ways, that could be considered part of a citizen science approach. So you have the bottom level, citizens as sensors, then citizens as basic interpreters, so understanding, reinterpreting the data. Then you have people actually engaging in level three in actually defining what the problems are, rather than we actually going and saying hand washing is the problem. You have a much broader uh, idea than that. And then level four extreme, actually we're analyzing the data with the researchers themselves. So we went and did some background reading and a research on how these different ideas or ways of engaging people in science and getting the wider community involved in it. And we came up with um, different uh, ways or mapping how the food system can be engaged with citizen science. Is my network quality going OK? I have just uh, received a warning. I might turn off my camera. Excuse me for just for one second. Um, and this is a very a wide ranging idea, but I'll just go through a, a couple of these. Um, firstly, citizen science could be used for ecological monitoring. So this means you could get people out. Um, so there was an example of school children actually measuring soil health around agricultural growing areas. Another community group measured uh, muscle pathology. So looking at local toxins collected by community members and then aggregating that. So you had a muscle watch um, over a series of years in 2013. And then finally, there's a brilliant example of a local environmental um, observer, which is a community network throughout 
throughout Alaska, Alaska that's looking at food pathogens and monitoring when, when and where permafrost is happening to actually safeguard houses and community food storage up in the north in the, throughout the winter. You then have different proposals such as urban growing, including the brilliant My Harvest um, project that was run from the University of Sheffield for the last three years. So looking at how you can actually engage people in growing different sorts of foods or allotmenting or urban gardening. And you can see here um, some provisional data from uh, Jill Edmondson, which was looking at the uh, My Harvest project, looking at My Harvest allotment growers crop yield versus conventional horticulture. So you can see courgettes and French beans, for instance, have a lot higher growing yields when uh, citizen science or on um, allotments than they do in conventional agriculture. That information can be taken to actually start using in other projects. We then also have um, engagement with artisanal or special uh, food processing and production. So two brilliant examples are food organizations engaging with brewers and bakers. So uh, this graph on the uh, side, as well as the project down the bottom, was getting different groups of bakers to actually swab their hands, swab their starters, and actually look at within their sourdough starters, these are all professional bakers, what the actual um, different fungals, bacteria, and yeasts were within those. So how did the um, sourdough and the product differ based on these different things and relating through to food, uh, food safety. There's also, um, we can remember the Soylent, which is a, a food substitute, as it were. That was started by a hacker networks of uh, citizens trying to actually engage and create new types of food. Um, and then you've finally got different hacker networks now, including the Real Vegan Cheese Biohacking Group. So actually people trying to work collaboratively with food scientists to create better vegan cheese. And then the Shinjo Jin meat product, which I'll spend a slide just discussing. So this is a Japanese not-for-profit, non-corporate, non-university citizen science community that is trying to make artificial meat or cellular agriculture. And it's putting cellular agriculture into public schools, into um, different places, into people's homes. And it means that it's much different and a much cheaper aspect than other cellular agriculture happening globally. So I would encourage people to check out them in terms of how you engage people in something that outside of Japan, in most discourses, is a very terrifying thing, cellular meat, but this humanizes it amazingly. Then one of the more important things for the food uh, FSA would be looking at how you can engage um, food citizen science in terms of allergy testing, food spoilage. Um, and one of the best examples of that was citizens actually using um, smartphone based uh, safety testing to look at how you could uh, post Fukushima in Japan. And there was a lot of tension there between Japanese food safety agencies and con the community. And if you would use citizen science, you could have had a much more open, engaged research network in terms of actually establishing where food risks, allergens, etc. Um, and then finally, community based public health. You could use methodologies via citizen science such as one voice or photo voice um, to look at eating environments, to look at logistics, to look at power, to look at how we can share recipes to educate people. So there's lots of different ways around public health interventions that citizen science could start to be used. But these again were just some of the aspects. I myself got into citizen science in uh, 2012 to 2014 when I was at the University of South Australia with the great koala count too. Um, before that was Operation Magpie and there's a picture of Dr. Phil Rutman there um, where we had an app. We got people to go outside and count the number of koalas in their backyard or local area over a couple of days to see the different population distributions throughout South Australia. By 2018 to 2020, uh, this had morphed into using the Zooniverse citizen science platform um, via some funding from the STFC Food Network Plus to actually ask people with pictures of food if they could estimate the environmental impact of those different portions. So people got a picture of different food from um, Newcastle's uh, FSA funded food um, composition um, images, um, different servings, um, and they were asked to estimate the number of calories. So using people as sensors, the very lowest amount, but what we were actually doing was seeing how sliders, multiple choice or text entry boxes would actually be as validation methods. And the spoilers, we found that on um, carbon footprint, which was the shocking one, both of them, most people underestimated carbon footprints of, sorry, most people um, overestimated carbon footprints of foods, except for in terms of um, animal products such as mints, where they um, actually underestimated. This is on a log scale. So you can see that for most things, people were underestimating the carbon footprint, which when we're talking about healthy, sustainable diets, means that mints underestimated, probably a bad thing, everything else overestimated, we can actually start to encourage them to eat more of these things because it's not the impact they think about it. 
We've also done uh, with a uh, research assistant of mine, Beth Armstrong, um, we looked at doing food safety citizen science. So asking people to measure their perceived um, safety aspects of different foods. So here are three foods to uh, look at this, and these are measured perceptions. So you can see here that, for instance, chicken was significantly different in food safety perception around people to apples and pasta. But then what happens when you start putting nationalities on that? Because we could put flags, and this was, we've nicknamed this the flag study in terms of safety. You could see that chicken, actually, if it was coming from the US or China, this research was carried out just as um, COVID struck, has a perceived higher risk than if it came from the UK, was marked for, from the EU or organic or fair trade chicken, or just generic chicken came as a force. You can see significant differences based on asking people about their perceptions around this. And we could expand these with different food sources and science methodologies. We've also used gamification, which means uh, this is a flash game. If you go to climatefoodchallenge.online, where you have to rank three different foods. And we've got people playing this game many, many millions of times. So we can actually build up a, a hierarchy of how different people perceive different types of foods, carbon footprints. But it's not just in a boring survey. We're doing it in games and getting people to help us design these games. So on the right of the screen here are some top trump flashcards, which we designed with school children to play in different games to educate and also to research how they view these different sorts of foods. Finally, at the University of Sheffield, um, we did multiple actions over the last two years uh, with the student union in different canteens, um, including putting a low impact logo on menus, providing milk guides, interviews with staff and students, providing climate ambassadors and also changing the menu during the climate strikes of 2019. Back, If you remember back to um, October and the heady days of students marching in the streets as a giant crowd. Um, and the interesting things here is we saw that oat milk due to these increased um, in part as well as other things. We can't, of course, do uh, causation correlation, but oat milk increased once these were in here. Um, and also the vegan sausages and uh, roasted Mediterranean vegetables increased from 2018 to 2019 when we put the low impact stickers on. And we also had medium impact stickers, um, which caused other items and other effects as well. Lots to go into there. I'm running out of time. So I will just take away thoughts saying that technology is enabling citizen science research in new and exciting ways as everything is happening today in some very inspiring talks. There are many ways citizen science can help engage, educate and advance food research. So let's start practicing it. I'll just give a thanks to my many collaborators. Um, if you have any questions, please contact me on Twitter or via my email address. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christian. Uh, that was really interesting and engaging. Uh, we now have a few questions from the audience. Um, and I'm going to start uh, with you, Christian. Um, so uh, can you post us somewhere a link to the citizen science paper chapter? Um. Of course, I, I'm very happy to. I will link, I'll go back through the slides and I'll post them in uh, comments and put that through to there so people can see the different papers I've got there because I know I move through those very fast. I'm sure the FSA are happy to share my slides afterward as well. Thank you. Yes, we plan to share the slides from all the presenters. How is the data from Citizen Science validated? So typically with our recent surveys, we're comparing them to traditional survey methodologies pushed through Qualtrics or Prolific. And also we've validated them versus um, Facebook and Twitter engagement. So we've we've tried to validate them versus identical questionnaire, questioning batteries using other methodologies. Um, and so far we've found there isn't significant difference between the answers given by these in terms of range distribution, etc. OK. And another question from uh, for you from Daniel Barlow uh, from the BSI, the UK standards body. Hacking and innovation quickly is a brilliant mindset and activity to address challenge, but consensus and collective efforts need to be there for the ideas to see wider impact. Is there a plan to bring consensus and standards to the latter stage of a project you discussed? Um, I've got to say I'm one researcher representing uh, many, many other researchers involved in food and citizen science. Um, if we're talking in terms of 
say biohacking and things like that, those are outside my exact area of expertise. Um, I'm more involved in say citizen food perceptions and say lived experience via a citizen science methodology and healthy sustainable diets. But I think definitely as citizen science projects continue to emerge, um, and the end deployment of new citizen science um, findings, you then have to uh, harmonize with standards if I have the question correct. Okay, thanks Christian. And uh, now a couple of questions for Helen and Katarina. Um, what were the participants' thoughts on using hand sanitizer versus washing their hands? Uh, yep, yeah, so, um, I think hand sanitizer had become uh, a habit that many participants had um, increased uh, re recently. Um, I think though what we definitely came out, what definitely came out of the research was that it didn't really quite have the same um, reassurance as washing your hands um, with soap and water. Um, I think it was generally perceived to be a bit less natural. Um, so while people were happy to use it as an in-between uh, and went outside of the home as kind of a safe option then, ultimately they really preferred the, the washing their hands with soap and water, which was a really interesting finding um, we picked up. Thanks, Katarina. And there is another question for you from Anna Morcott. Um, the app is interesting, but how does the presence of a device not itself risk creating a desirability bias? people themselves put it there and control at what it is pointing. Yeah, so I'm happy to answer this, but apologies for not having my um, camera on and having a few internet issues. So hopefully you can hear me OK. I think social desirability bias, you can never uh, get rid of it 100 percent. We can never be certain that it's gone but what we can do is put in um you know to mitigate the effect of it so firstly we we do the warm-up interview with participants so they're they are always told that there's no right or wrong answers they're free to answer things as they honestly do so that already helps to reduce it we the study was for two weeks so we would expect to see that participants get more comfortable with using the app over that time period so they can answer quite freely and honestly um, using technology in itself distances the participant from the research to some extent so it becomes part of their daily routine to answer questions on the app whereas for example if you had a researcher in the room with you that might feel quite imposing so there is an advantage to using this and finally, I think using a mixed methods approach. So we did do interviews alongside um, helps to mitigate again because we have another method by which we can compare the results. Um, so we're kind of taking a multi pronged approach to reducing that uh, desirability bias. Um, Catherine, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add to that or if you feel that covers mostly what we what we did to resolve that issue. Um, no, I, I think that was a, a really good answer, Helen. Um, I think, I guess it's just worth saying that um, this was an issue we were aware of right from the start and um, a member of our, our team did a really excellent kind of quick literature review on, on how social desirability could be, uh, bias could be kind of reduced in the research design. So we very much looked at other studies, as Helen said, to pick up on those kind of techniques and, and things to try and reduce that in the, in the overall design of this work. Yeah. Thanks, Wolf. Uh, there is now um, a question from uh, Kanye. Does FSA have a quantitative research on COVID-19 and consumers? Uh, can I just send for you the link uh, to the uh, page on our website where uh, we collect all the research that we are currently doing on consumer related to COVID-19? Um, and there is more that we are currently doing and it will be soon published uh, there and made available there. Uh, most of the uh, data presented uh, at the, during the first presentation by Michelle uh, was actually coming from our um, analysis and uh, new surveys including tracker that we introduced during the pandemic. Uh, but more importantly, our, our ongoing research is starting to picking up uh, trends on both consumers and uh, on the business side 
addressing the impact of COVID. Uh, it's actually been more difficult on the business side because for obvious reason, we haven't been able to engage with business as much as we wanted. Uh, and um, uh, we have also to delay the usual uh, engagement that we would do with them to better understand um, uh, issues around food safety and food authenticity. Um, but please keep a link on this. Uh, I don't know if Catherine, Helen, you'd like to add anything for Kami on this? Not from me, thank you. No, thanks, Anna. Okay, and um, I see Christian has just replied to the last question, and uh, I think now we have reached uh, the time for lunch. Uh, we will pause uh, for 40 minutes uh, so that everyone can have a lunch. And um, we welcome you back um, at uh, 10 past one. Um, as a reminder, you still need to join the third and last link that is being provided in the instruction. And we will have now a slide that will uh, uh, show you the reminder. Um, so we hope to have you back and uh, the, la uh, the afternoon session will be moderated uh, by Michelle Patel. So I'd like to thank you all for listening uh, during the morning. It's been a really interesting, although very fast paced, engaging uh, sessions, um, mostly um, successful and uh, Thanks to the people on the background that have been uh, uh, ensuring that everyone was running smoothly. Thanks Kabir and thanks Becky uh, for all the work that is happening on the background. Thanks again for the presenters today and we will be back at 10 past one. Thank you very much. Bye.